It is my very great pleasure to present to you our speaker today, Professor Milton Friedman. What I want to talk about is really an issue which is very much related to the whole problem of human freedom. It has to do with the question of whether capitalism is humane and what you mean by that. I am sure many of you have heard the, funny, the old story about the two poles who met one another and one pole said to the other, tell me, do you know the difference between capitalism and socialism? And the other pole said, no, I don't know the difference. And the first poll said, well, you know, under capitalism, man exploits man. And the other fellow shook his head. Well, under socialism, he said, it's vice versa. <laughs> well, now that, as a matter of fact, in the present uh, uh, intellectual atmosphere of the world, is a relatively favorable evaluation of capitalism. The interesting thing to me about this is that the, oh, the arguments, the issues in this debate which has been going on for so long about the form of government have changed. The argument used to be about strictly the form of economic organization. Should we have government control of production and distribution or should we have a market control? And the argument used to be made in terms of the supposedly greater efficiency of centralized government and of centralized control. Nobody makes that argument anymore. There is hardly a person in the world who will claim that nationalized industries or socialism as a method of economic organization is an efficient way to organize things. The examples of Great Britain, the examples of Russia, the examples of some of the other states around the world that have adopted these measures, plus the domestic grown examples of the post office and its fellows, have put an end to that kind of talk. But the interesting thing is that nonetheless, there is widespread opposition for ca to capitalism as a system of organization, and there is widespread support for some vague system labeled socialism. The most dramatic example of the change in the character, the argument, and the paradox that I'm really bringing out is Germany. Here was Germany, which experienced all the horrors of the Nazi totalitarian state in the 1930s. Here is Germany, which after the war, under the Erhard policy of social Marktwirtschaft, social market economy, had an economic miracle with an enormous rise in total income, enormous rise in the well-being of the German people, of the ordinary people. And yet, in Germany, despite the demonstration of the horrors on the one side of a totalitarian state, and on the other, of the benefits of a relatively free market, here in Germany you will find a very large fraction of all intellectuals remain, anti not only remain, have become even more strongly anti-capitalist, have become proponents of collectivism of one form or another. Only a small number have gone into the more extreme versions that you've been reading about in the paper of the, of the uh, uh, terrorists. But a very large fraction of the intellectuals, those who write for the newspapers, those who are on television and so on, are fundamentally anti-capitalist in their mentality. And the question is why? What is it that has produced this shift? Now one of the most, or not this shift, what is it that produces this consistent attitude of anti-capitalism on the one hand and pro-something called collectivism on the other among intellectuals? One of the most interesting analyses of these problems I know is by a Russian dissident mathematician named Shafarevich. His essay, which has never been published, needless to say, in Russia, but uh, it, it appears in English translation in a book called Under the Rubble, which has been edited by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And I strongly recommend that particular paper to you. In it, 
He discusses the appeal of socialism over the ages. He goes back a thousand or two thousand years. And he comes out with the conclusion that just as Freud pointed to the death wish in individuals as a fundamental psychological propensity, the appeal of capitalism, he argued, I'm sorry, the appeal of socialism and the opposition to capitalism is really a fundamental sign of a death wish for society on the part of intellectuals. It's a very intriguing, <laughs> strange, and at first sight, highly improbable kind of an interpretation. Yet I urge you all to read that essay because you will find that it is very disturbing by having a great deal more sense to it than you would suppose such a position could possibly have. I'm not going to take that line. Maybe he's right, but I think there's a very much simpler analysis, a simpler reason for this. And that simpler reason is a combination of a supposed emphasis on moral values and ignorance and misunderstanding about the relationship between moral values and economic systems. I may say the emphasis on moral values is almost always on the part of people who do not have economic problems. It's not on the part of the masses. But the problem with this approach, the problem of trying to interpret and analyze a system, either pro or con, in terms of such concepts as the morality of the system or the humanity of the system, whether capitalism is humane or socialism is humane, or moral or immoral. The problem with that is that moral values are individual. They are not collective. Moral values have to do with what each of us separately believes and holds true, what, what our own individual values are. Capitalism, socialism, central planning, are means, not ends. They, in and of themselves, are neither moral nor immoral, humane nor inhumane. We have to ask, what are their results? We have to look at what are the consequences of adopting one or another system of organization. And from that point of view, the crucial thing is to look beneath the surface. Don't look at what the proponents of one system or another say are their intentions but look at what the actual results are. Socialism, which means government ownership and operation of means of production, has appealed to high-minded, fine people, to people of idealistic views, because of the supposed objectives of socialism, especially because of the supposed objectives of equality, of equality and social justice. Now, those are fine objectives, and it's a tribute to the people of good will that those objectives should appeal to them. But you have to ask the question, does the system, no matter what its proponents say, produce those results? And once you look at the results, it's crystal clear that they do not. Where are social injustices greatest? Social injustices are clearly greatest where you have central control. The degree of social injustice and torture in a place like, and in, in incarceration in a place like Russia is of a different order of magnitude than it is in those Western countries where most of us have grown up and in which we have been accustomed to regarding freedom as our natural heritage. Social injustice in a country like Yugoslavia, which is a much more benign communist state than Russia, and yet, you ask Gilas, who languishes in prison for having written a book. You ask the people at the University of Belgrade who have been sent to prison, or many others who have been ejected from the country. Social injustice in China, where you have had thousands of people murdered because of their opposition to the government. Again, you look at the question of inequality of equality. Where do you have the greatest degree of inequality? In the socialist states of the world. I remember about 15 years ago, my wife and I were in Russia for a couple of weeks. We were in Moscow. And we were, uh, we were going with our tourist uh, guide and happened to see, I happened to see some of the fancy Russian limousines up there, the Zivs. They were sort of a takeoff on the 1938 American Packards. 
And I asked our tourist guide out of amusement, how much do those sell for? Oh, she said, those aren't for sale. Those are only for the members of the Politburo. You have in a country like Soviet Union enormous inequality in the immediate literal sense that there is a small select group that has all of the services and amenities of life and very large masses that are on a very, very low standard of living. Indeed, in a more direct way. If you take the wage rate of foremen versus the wage rate of ordinary workers in the Soviet Union, the ratio is much greater than it is in the United States. I am reminded again of another, if I, I seem somehow to be referring to Poland, but on this same trip that we took to Russia, we stopped in Poland, in Warsaw, for a while, and we met there a marvelous man, a man by the name of Edward Lipinski, who was in this country a year ago at the age of 83 or 4, I believe was arrested when he got back to Poland because he had been one of those who had signed and authored a declaration against the suppression of, of freedom of thought and speech in Poland. But at the time we met Edward Lipinski, he was, seemed to be fairly free, he is a, was a man who had been a socialist all his life. And this was really very hard for, he was now in his 70s, I may say, when we saw him, he was retired. Very hard thing for a man to go back on all of his lifelong beliefs. And so he said as follows to us, he said, you know, he said, I used to believe in socialism, I still do. But socialism is an ideal. We can't have it in the real world, he said, until we're rich enough to be able to afford it. And he said, socialism will be practical when every man in Poland has a house and two servants. And I said to him, including the servants? And he said, yes. <laughs> now, capitalism, on the other hand, is a system of organization that relies on private property and voluntary exchange. It has repelled people. It's driven them away from supporting it because they have thought it emphasized self-interest in a narrow way, because they were repelled by the idea of people pursuing their own interest rather than some broader interest. Yet if you look at the results, it's clear that the results go the other way around. There is no, it's in the capitalist societies of the world, where ca only where capitalism has prevailed over long periods have you had both freedom and prosperity. The greatest measures of freedom if you look at the Western countries where freedom prevails, it doesn't prevail perfectly. We all have our defects, but by and, on, by and on the large, few would deny that in the United States, in Great Britain, in France, in Germany, in Western Europe, we have a greater degree of freedom on an individual and personal level than you do in most other places around the world. In Australia, Japan, to a considerable extent today, though not 200 years ago, if you look, you will find that freedom has prevailed where you've had capitalism and that simultaneously so has the well-being and the prosperity of the ordinary man. There's been more social justice and less inequality. Now the question is that you have to ask, and you have to ask the proponents of these two systems, has socialism failed because its good qualities were perverted by evil men who got in charge? Was it simply because Stalin took over from Lenin that communism went the way it did? Has capitalism succeeded despite the immoral values it pervaded? I think the answer to both questions is in the negative. The results have arisen because each system has been true to its own values. Or rather, a system doesn't have values, I don't mean that, has been true to the values it encourages, supports, and develops in the people who live under that system. What we're concerned with in discussing moral values here are those that have to do with the relations between people. It's important to distinguish between two sets of moral considerations. The morality that is relevant to each of us in our private life. How we each individually conduct ourselves, behave, and then what's relevant to systems of government and organization are the relations between people. And in judging relations among, between people, I do not believe that the fundamental value is to do good to others 
whether they want you to or not. The fundamental value is not to do good to others as you see their good. It's not to force them to do good. As I see it, the fundamental value in relations to Hmong people is to respect the dignity and the individuality of fellow men. To treat your fellow man not as an object to be manipulated for your purpose, but to treat him as a person with his own values and his own rights. A person to be persuaded, not coerced, not forced, not bulldozed, not brainwashed. That seems to me to be a fundamental value from in social relations. In all systems, whether you call them socialism, capitalism, or anything else, people act from self-interest. The citizens of Russia act from self-interest in the same way as the citizens of the United States do. The difference between the two countries is in what determines self-interest. The man in the United States who is serving as a foreman in a factory, his self-interest leads him to worry about not getting fired. The man in Russia who is acting as foreman in a factory, his self-interest leads him to worry about not being fired at. <laughs> Both are pursuing their own self-interest. But the sanctions, the effects, what makes it in their self-interest is different in the one case than in the other. But self-interest should not be interpreted as narrow selfishness. I quote a man who speaks much more eloquently than I can. This is Thoreau, and I quote him from Walden. Here's what Thoreau said about unselfishness as a moral virtue. He said, there is no odor so bad as that which arises from goodness tainted. If I knew for a certainty that a man was coming to my house with the conscious design of doing me good, I should run for my life. <laughs> Philanthropy is almost the only virtue which is sufficiently appreciated by mankind. Nay, it is greatly overrated, and it is, to our, it is our selfishness which overrates it. If anything ail a man so that he does not perform his functions, if he have a pain in his bowels even, for that is a seat of sympathy, he forthwith sets about reforming the world. Being a microcosm himself, he discovers, and it is a true discovery, and he is the man to make it, that the world has been eating green apples. To his eyes, in fact, the globe itself is a great green apple, which there is danger awful to think of that the children of men will nibble before it is ripe. And straight away, his drastic philanthropy seeks out the Eskimo and the Patagonian and embraces the populous Indian and Chinese villages. That's Thoreau on unselfishness as a moral value. More important and more fundamentally, whenever we depart from voluntary cooperation and try to do good by using force, the bad moral value of force triumphs over good intentions. And you realize this is highly relevant to what I am saying, because the essential notion of a capitalist society, which I'll come back to, is voluntary cooperation, voluntary exchange. The essential notion of a socialist society is fundamentally force. If the government is the master, if society is to be run from the cent center, what are, you, what are you doing? You ultimately have to order people what to do. What is your ultimate sanction? Go back a ways. Take it on a milder level. Whenever you try to do good with somebody else's money, you are committed to using force. How can you do good with somebody else's money unless you first take it away from them? The only way you can take it away from them is by the threat of force. You have a policeman, a tax collector, who comes and takes it from them. This is carried much farther if you really have a socialist society. If you have an organization from the center, if you have supposed government bureaucrats running things, that can only ultimately rest on force. But whenever you resort to force, even to try to do good, you must not question people's motives. Maybe they're evil sometimes, but look at the results of what they do. 
Give them the benefit of the doubt. Assume their motives are good. You know, there's an old saying about the road to hell being paved with good intentions. You have to look at the outcome. And whenever you use force, the bad moral value of force triumphs over good intentions. The reason is not only that famous aphorism of Lord Acton. You all know it, you've all heard it. Absolute power corrupts. Absol I'm sorry, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's the whole aphorism. That's one reason why trying to do good with methods that involve force lead to bad results. Because the people who set out with good intentions are themselves corrupted. And I may add, if they're not corrupted, they're replaced by people with bad intentions who are more efficient at getting control of the use of force. But also, the fundamental reason is more profound. The most harm of all is done when power is in the hands of people who are absolutely persuaded of the purity of their instincts of their, and of the purity of their intentions. Uh, Thoreau said that philanthropy is a much overrated virtue. Sincerity is also a much overrated virtue. Heaven preserve us from the sincere reformer who knows what's good for you and by, by heaven is going to make you do it whether you like it or not. That's when you get the greatest harm done. I have no reason to doubt that Lenin was a man whose intentions were good. Maybe they weren't. But he was completely persuaded that he was right and he was willing to use any methods at all for the ultimate good. Again, it's interesting to contrast the experience of Hitler versus Mussolini. Mussolini was much less of a danger to human rights because he was a hypocrite. Because he didn't really believe what he was saying. He was just in there for the game. He started out as a socialist. He turned to a fascist. He was willing to be bribed by whoever would bribe him the most. As a result, there were at least some protections against his arbitrary rule. But Hitler was a sincere fanatic. He believed in what he was doing. And he did far greater harm. Or, if I may take you onto a minor key, in which you may not join me, I realize. Ralph Nader is a modern example of the same thing. I have no doubt that Ralph is sincere. I have no doubt that he means what he says. But that's why he's so dangerous a man who is threatening our freedom. In the past, in the past few decades, in the past few decades, there has been a great decline in the moral climate. There are few people who doubt the decline in the moral climate. We see evidences of it here. The lack of civility in discussions among people. The resort to chance instead of arguments. These are all evidences on one level of a decline in moral climate. But we see it also in the rising crime statistics, in the lack of respect for property, in the kind of rioting that broke out in New York after the blackout, in the problems of maintaining discipline in elementary schools. Why? Why have we had such a decline in moral climate? I submit to you that a major factor has because, been because of a change in the philosophies which have been prominent in society from a belief in individual responsibility to a supposed belief in social responsibility, from a tendency to get away from the individual, from his responsibility for his own life and his own behavior. If he doesn't behave properly, that's his responsibility and he's to be charged with it. To a belief that after all it's society that is responsible. If you adopt the view that everything belongs to society, then it belongs to nobody. Why should I have any respect for property if it belongs to everybody? If you adopt the view that no man is responsible for his own behavior, because somehow or other society is responsible, well then, why should he seek to make his behavior good? Now of course, don't misunderstand me, on a scientific level it's true that what we are is affected a great deal by the society in which we live and grow up, of course. All of us are different than we would have been if we had grown up in a different society. 
So it's not, I'm not denying in the slightest the effect on all of us of the social institutions within which we operate, both on our values and our opportunity, on our opportunities. But I am only saying that a set of social institutions which stresses individual responsibility, which stresses the responsibility for the, of the individual, given the kind of person he is, the kind of society in which he operates, to be responsible for himself, is the kind of a society which is likely to have a much higher and more responsible moral climate than the kind of a society in which you stress the lack of responsibility of the individual for what happens to him. Let me note the schizophrenia in the talk about social responsibility. There's always a tendency to excuse the people who are harmed by what happens or the people who are regarded as the victims. There's always a tendency to excuse them from any responsibility. They didn't riot in Harlem because they had no control over their emotions, because they were bad people or because they were irresponsible people, no. They rioted because of what society did to them. That's the argument. But nobody ever turns it around and argues the other way. If the people who rioted are innocent of guilt because society who did it to them, then aren't the people who are singled out as the oppressors also free of guilt? Do you hear these same people say, oh no, we mustn't blame those bad people who trample the poor under their feet because they're not doing it out of their own individual will. Society is making them, forcing them to do it. If you're going to use the doctrine of social responsibility, you ought to be even-handed both ways. It excuses both the victim and the person who is, who, I can't say responsible because that would be inconsistent, the person who is alleged to be responsible for the victimization. And similarly, you must be even-handed on both sides. We must, all of us, be individually responsible for what we do to our fellow men, whether that be harm or good. There's an additional reason why you've had a decline in the moral climate. You'll pardon me for returning to my, my discipline of economics, but there's a fundamental economic law which has never been contradicted to the best of my knowledge. And that is, if you pay more for something, there will tend to be more of that something available. If the amount you're willing to pay for anything goes up, somehow or other, somebody will supply more of that thing. We have made immoral behavior far more profitable. We have, in the course of the changes in our society, been establishing greater and greater incentives on people to behave in ways that most of us regard as immoral. On each of us separately, we've all been doing it. One of the examples that has always appealed to me along these lines is the example of Great Britain. Not now, but in the 19th century. And 18th century. You know, in the 18th century, Britain was regarded as a nation of smugglers, of law avoiders, of people who broke the law. In the 19th and early 20th century, Britain got the reputation for being the most law-beating country in the world, an incorruptible civil service. Everybody knew about the fact that you couldn't bribe a civil servant in Britain the way you could one in, say, Italy or New York. <laughs> How did that come about? How did a nation of smugglers with no respect for the law, get converted into a nation of people obedient to the law. Very simply, by, a, by, by the laissez-faire policy adopted in the 19th century, which eliminated laws to break. <laughs> if you had complete free trade, if you had complete free trade, as you did after the abolition of the corn laws, there was no more smuggling. It was a meaningless term. You were free to bring anything into the country you wanted. You couldn't be a smuggler. It was impossible. If you didn't need a license to establish a business, you didn't need a license to open up a factory, what was there to bribe a civil servant for? The civil servants became incorruptible because there was nothing to bribe them for. Now, of course, these patterns, there's a cultural lag, as you have all learned in your anthropology courses. 
And these patterns, once they develop, last for a while. But what has been happening in Britain in the last 30 and 40 years is Britain has been moving away from essentially laissez-faire and toward a much more controlled and centralized economy. This reputation for law obedience is disappearing. You've had repeated scandals about ministers of the government, about members of parliament, about civil servants who have been bribed, about the rise in gang warfare and the rest. Why? Because you're establishing an incentive. You've got more laws to break now. It's much more fundamental. When the only laws are those laws which everybody regards as right and valid, they have great moral force. When you make laws that people separately do not regard as right and valid, they lose their moral force. Is there anybody in here who has a moral compunction to speeding? I'm not saying you may not have a prudential objection to speeding. You may be afraid you'll get caught. But does it seem to you immoral to speed? Maybe. If so, you're a small minority. I have never yet found anybody who regarded it immoral as immoral to violate the foreign exchange regulations of a foreign country. Here are people who would never dream for a moment of stealing a nickel from their neighbor, who have no hesitancy on manipulating their income tax returns so as to reduce their taxes by thousands. Why? Because the one set of laws have a moral value that people recognize independent of the, law, of the government having passed these laws. The other set do not appeal to people's moral instincts. So I believe, well, let me give you some more examples from the United States. Prohibition of liquor, which was attempted, as you know, had disastrous effects on the climate of law, obedience, and morality. Something which had been legal to buy and drink some alcoholic beverages became illegal. And you converted law-abiding citizens into bootleggers. I heard over the 60 Minutes on the program last Sunday night a great story on butt-legging. This has to do with the fact that the New York State tax on cigarettes is very much higher than the tax on cigarettes in the state of South Carolina. So you have people going down to South Carolina and buying the South Carolina low-taxed cigarettes and smuggling it into New York State and uh, uh, forging New York State tax stamps on it and then selling it to uh, uh, publicly, a large fraction of all cigarettes sold in New York State are butt legged. Now, there you've provided an incentive for people to break the law, so they break the law. It's like prohibition in a different form. The obvious answer is for New York State to lower its taxes, and you will eliminate butt legging overnight and, and be able to take whatever may be the number of policemen who are devoted to enforcing that kind of thing, you will be able to take them and turn them to useful work. I go back, however, <coughs> to, the, to the essence of capitalism and its relevance to the question of humanity. As I say, the essence of a capitalist system in its pure form is that it is a system of cooperation without compulsion, of voluntary exchange, of free enterprise. Now I hasten to add, no actual system conforms to that notion. In the actual world, you're always dealing with approximations, with more or less. In the actual world, you always have impediments and interferences to voluntary exchange. But the essential character of a capitalist system is that it relies on voluntary exchange, on your agreeing with me that you will buy something from me if I will pay you a certain amount for it. The essential notion is that both parties to the exchange must benefit. This was a great vision of Adam Smith in his Wealth of Nations, that individuals each separately pursuing their own self-interest could promote the social interest because you could get exchange between people on the basis of mutual benefit. Now, I want to emphasize to you here for this purpose that this notion extends far beyond economic matters narrowly conceived. That's really the main point I want to get across here. And I want to give you some very different kinds of examples. Consider the development of language. The English language. There was never any central government that dictated the English language that set up some rules for it. There was no planning board that determined what words should be nouns and what words vowels and I mean what words adjectives. 
language grew through the free market, through voluntary cooperation. I used a word, you used a word. If it was mutually advantageous to us to keep on using that word, we keep on using it. Language grows, it develops, it expands, it contracts through the free market. Consider the body a common law, not legislated law, which is a very different thing, but the body a common law. People voluntarily chose to go to a court and allow the court to adjudicate their dispute. In the process, there arose and developed the body of common law. Again, no central plan, no central coordination. You are here in an academic institution. How did scientific knowledge and understanding arise? How do we get the development of science? Is there somehow or other a government agency that decides what are the most important problems to be studied that prevents cooperation? Unfortunately, there are developing such agencies. But in the history of science, that isn't the way science developed. Science developed out of free market exchange. It developed on occasion with the patronage of an authority, but voluntary cooperation among the scientists. I read voluntarily the work that is done by economists in other lands. They read my work. They take the parts of it they like. They discard the parts they don't. In the process, you build a more and more complicated system through voluntary free voluntary exchange based on the principle of mutual benefit. Similarly to a free market in ideas. Again, that is a free market of exactly the same kind as the economic market and no different and the two are very closely interrelated. Is it a violation of the free market in goods or the free market in ideas if a country as Great Britain did immediately after the war has exchange control under which no citizen of Britain may buy a foreign book unless he got authorization from the Bank of England to acquire the foreign currency. Is that any restriction on human and economic freedom? Or is it a restriction on ideas, on the free market and ideas? I want to give you a final example which goes back to the fundamental question we've been raising and that's voluntary charitable activity. I want you to ask you a question. Go back to the 19th century in the United States. It was a period when you had about the closest approximation to a capitalist society you can imagine, in which the federal government was spending roughly an amount equal to roughly 3% of the national income, almost entirely on the Army and Navy. State and local governments were spending about 6 or 7% of the national income, mostly on schooling. Very little of what has come to be regarded as welfare activities. Yet the 19th century was a period of the greatest burst of voluntary charitable activity that we have seen in this country or any other country at any other time. When was Cornell established? How? It was established by the voluntary benefaction of the man who gave you your name. Sometime, what was it, 1860 something. That period of the 19th century saw the emergence of a host of private colleges, universities throughout the country. My own University of Chicago was established in 1890 on voluntary, by voluntary eleemosynary activity. It was also the period which saw the growth and development of the nonprofit charitable hospital. It saw the establishment of foreign missions, of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, of the Boy Scouts, you name it. There is hardly a voluntary activity, the Carnegie Libraries, the free public library. Why was it that voluntary activity flourished? Because again, the free market, voluntary cooperation among people, cooperating to pursue their common interests is a far more effective and efficient way of producing charitable results than any other known to man. I ask you, what is a common element in all of these cases I've mentioned? Language, common law, scientific knowledge, ideas, charitable activity. The development of an elaborate and complex structure without any central planning and without coercion. No central planning in language, in common law, in scientific knowledge, in ideas, in voluntary activity. And yet you develop complex mechanisms, complex structures with order with structures which after the event you can analyze in logical terms. Without coercion, you have progress through harmony rather 
than the attempt to impose progress through coercion. Capitalism is often reproached as being materialistic. It's often reproached as erecting money as a chief motive. But yet again, look at the facts. I may say, you know, money is not a very noble motive, but it's cleaner than most. But look at the facts. Who has produced the great achievements of mankind? Can you name me a great play that has been written by a government committee? Can you name me an invention that was produced by a government bureau? The great works that are the great achievements of mankind have all been the achievements of individuals, of a Shakespeare or a George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw is a beautiful example because, of course, as you know, he wrote the book, the famous book, The Intelligent Woman's Guide to Socialism. He regarded himself as a socialist. But his career and his performance is a striking demonstration of the virtues of the capitalist system he opposed. Again, in science, it's Einstein, Copernicus, Galileo, who are the great con contributors of scientific ideas, not through government central organization, but mostly in spite of it. In Galileo's case, as you know, despite persecution by the centralized authorities of his time. Again, in the areas of charity, Florence Nightingale was not a government civil servant. She was a private individual, human being, who was seeking to achieve the objective she held dear. She was pursuing her self-interest. The plain fact is that in any society, whatever it may be its form of organization, the people who are not interested in material values are a small minority. There are no societies in the world today that are more materialistic than the collectivist societies. It's the Russian societies, it's the Chinese societies, it's the Yugoslav societies that put all their stress on materialism, on achieving economic goals and five-year plans that destroy the non-materialistic achievements of mankind. Why? Because they are in a, possession to, a position to suppress minorities. What we want for a society that is at once humane and gives opportunity for great human achievements is in a society in which that small minority, minority of people who do not have materialistic objectives, who are interested in some of these other achievements, have the greatest degree of freedom. And the only society that anybody has ever invented, that anybody has ever discovered, that comes close to doing that, is a capitalist society. When you hear people objecting to the market or to capitalism, and you examine their objections, you will find that most of those objections are objections to freedom itself. What most people are objecting to is that the market gives people what the people want instead of what the person talking thinks the people ought to want. This is true whether you are ta talking of the objections of a Galbraith to the market, whether you are talking of the objections of a Nader to the market, whether you are talking of the objections of a Marx or an Engels or a Lenin to the market. The problem is that in a market society, in a society in which people are free to do their own thing, in which people make voluntary deals, it's hard to do good. You've got to persuade people, and there's nothing in this world harder. But the important thing is that in that kind of society, it's also hard to do harm. It's true that if you had a concentrated power in the hands of an angel, he might be able to do a lot of good, as he viewed it. But one man's good is another man's bad. And the great virtue of a market capitalist society is that it pre by preventing a concentration of power, it prevents people from doing the kind of harm which really concentrated power can do. So that I conclude, that capitalism per se is not humane or inhumane. Socialism per se is not humane or inhumane. But capitalism tends to give, the, give free reign, much freer reign, to the more humane values of human beings. It tends to develop a climate which is more favorable to the development, on the one hand, of a higher moral atmosphere of responsibility,
and on the other to greater achievements in every realm of human understanding. Thank you.